we even did a video where we are teasing a Puerto Rican girl because she's not saying her R's. And what we didn't realize was that that is also anti-Black. Very much so, yeah. What's up guys, today we're gonna to be hanging out with one of my amazing friends, Amando Guerrero, who is a Latinx yogi here in LA and also a Spanish linguist at UCLA. He is a professor. We're gonna be discussing certain words that are rooted in being problematic. And we're gonna leave it up to you guys, the viewer, to decide whether or not you wanna be a difference in the world and not use these words that can really hurt and oppress a lot of people, particularly for those of the black community and the indigenous community. We're gonna review some words that you already might know about and some words that you probably had no idea that you were using that were super problematic. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Armando Guerrero and I'm a lecturer of Spanish linguistics at UCLA. And today we're going to be talking about language ideology and how they relate to Spanish and colorism and racism in our Spanish speaking communities. You and I are old friends. I am such a fan of your work and I'm a fan of like what you represent. We've been seeing kind of like a lot of movement and a lot of action and a lot of conversations surrounding a lot of things like in our own communities, internalized racism, it, whether it's racism entre nosotros. You said language will forever represent a unique geographic landscape and socio-cultural histories, including that of colonized people and their colonizer. It's almost polarizing, right? Because we're speaking a language that is inherently a, a colonizing language, right? It's the language that was spoken by the colonizer. And the same thing uh, pertains to Spanish. So there's a relationship here, a historical relationship. Uh, and that's what I was alluding to uh, with that statement. Because of the way that our ancestors were treated, it's led to certain words that people kind of use in order to either diss somebody else or uplift somebody else. You've said this before, is that you're not looking to change the way that people speak because language is really very much a part of the culture. You're mostly just like educating people on what it is that they are saying. And then they can choose to practice that change. I really like to empower folks with, with the tools to see what it is that they're manifesting with their work. And, and these different terms or different statements, uh, what they're doing is they're reflecting a social reality that we are also partaking in maintaining or keeping up. The first statement that we have on our list, pelo bueno, pelo malo. The fact that a lot of people use the word, and by a lot of people I mean like a lot of Mexican folk, use the word pelo chino, which is also derived from anti-Black uh, language. So the closer you are to Blackness, people see it as malo. And the closer your hair is to being straight is pelo bueno. And then we also talked about how pelo chino comes from the Mexican caste system where people who had a tighter kink or coil in their hair were compared to the coil of the tail on a pig. And so they were called cochinos and then made short into chino, which is why it's very confusing to a lot of people when people are like pelo chino, because you think like, oh, Chinese hair would probably be long and straight, not tight and curly. So like, what do you, like, what do you think about those as well? It's ways that these structures are peeking through, right? And, and this is where concepts like mestizaje become problematic, right? Mm. Particularly in, in Mexico. So I'm, I'm more familiar with um, uh, the Mexican dynamic. Of, of identity and and this mestizaje it's essentially it's color blindness but color isn't blind ever and it's actually very totalizer these ideologies like they're creating um this black and white dynamic as soon as you have that reference you're automatically have the counterpart right so there's a lot of value in maintaining the structure when you compare someone's hair to the tail of, of a pig, because as, as you do that, you automatically do the inverse, which is to, to uphold the privilege of what we see as the contrary. One statement can do one thing, and then another statement does another thing. And when you put them all together, like you form this structure that informs your reality about black people. And that's very, very much true in, in our Spanish speaking communities in the US. Uh, these ideas that we have, they fit into themselves. Having the pelo bueno, which is the only pelo that we see, um, we automatically assume the complete inverse of, of el pelo malo, right? Mm. Which is every other hair that's not like my hair. We eliminate certain things and that's our, our, our third part in this process, which is erasure. And more people are familiar with, with erasure. Essentially, it's this kind of 
uh, deleting or, or getting rid of anything that challenges this black and white dynamic, like if it didn't exist. Here's your deciding point. Are you going to cancel it or are you going to keep using it? Guarito versus Indio. So one of the things that we talked about was how originally there is data to suggest that Guero actually meant like empty egg. And it also meant like sickly pale, like it meant that you look sickly. It looked like, you know, maybe you get a little sunlight. Now it's used to refer to white Latinx or it's used in ways to kind of suggest superiority in a place of service. So like if you're a waiter somewhere or if you're a merchant somewhere. It's a good way to begin to understand um, el uso de huero, particularly because it's not really something that's used as often or it's not something that I hear as often. And even though we don't use it as often here, it's not something that we don't use. I've, I've heard it sometimes and this is why we're talking about it because huero is something that we almost use as an automatic thing. Uh, one of those contexts um, is in, in the context of service. So where you would hear it a lot, or where you will hear it a lot, in Mexico in particular, it's going to be when you go to the mercado. And as you're walking around and people want to catch your attention so that you can patronize their their um, local, their, their place of business, um, they're going to refer to you as güero. They're going to make this dynamic very clear. Where I'm servicing you, um, and I'm referencing you to, to the term that I have for whiteness, particularly in a Mexican context, tienes el mestizaje. So uh, these different categories don't exist um, as, as, as white, indigenous, and black, uh, and these different dynamics, like we're all everything. So, uh, in practice, that's not really true. These terms that we use, and this term that we're using in particular, that's what it's doing. Yeah. Uh, it's still alluding to whiteness, and what whiteness means, right? And it's doing it almost uh, in a hidden way because it's not saying, um, oye blanco, right? It's saying, oye huero. And we're not making that association that it has to do with an egg and the egg is white and white it's sickly and all these different um, associations, right? And this is why we're doing the video, right? Yeah. To make those connections. Like people will use it more as like a compliment. It's like a good thing. It's a nice thing. Because indio on the flip is used very much as a diss. Whether they're saying to describe their fashion, the idea that humans and the beautiful characteristics that make up a certain culture and a certain type and, and a phenotype of human can be regarded as a negative. And everything associated with that human being, because that's what we're doing with with the use of a word like indio right, in its derogatory uh, fashion. And again, it's it's doing the same process that we've been talking about. It's creating a certain image, it's creating certain contrast. And at the same time, it's also erasing or deleting uh, other realities, right? It's saying Indio, um, the way that uh, it's, that I've, I've heard it be used too, is is kind of uh, in, a, in conjunction with uh, ignorante, right? And what that means, right? The image that you're associating with that, someone that doesn't have access to um, education or knowledge for, for some for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, and even that, it creates this whole other tree, right? This whole yeah. other structure of el que sabe, el que no sabe. Uh, this is why it's a continual uh, learning process. Yeah. And, and this particular term, that, that's what it's doing. And uh, the combination that I'm referring to, by the way, is uh, indiorante, which is indio uh, e ignorante. Whiteness was truly a currency, and it still is in these countries. And all, yeah. I mean, globally like whiteness is is a global currency you can take back this language and india should not be a diss to anybody you shouldn't be offended by that you know like in fact like you should wear it you should honor your roots the way that people think that you look whether we cancel the use of this word is how are you using it this one for me is a little bit nuanced right because if you are saying like yeah. Te miras pura India, and you mean it with the highest regard of the word, like, you look beautiful. Maybe we don't cancel that. Which brings us to our next word, which is tener el nopal en la frente. That, I feel like, is used all over. We use it to, to kind of call somebody out who doesn't speak back in Spanish to us. Or it's also used to be like, why is that person fronting? Because they, I could tell where you're from. I could tell based off of your yeah. phenotype, right? Tenerlo para en la frente, like, what does that mean exactly? Like having a cactus in front of your face, like. <laughs> it's it's a very like visual way of saying that I have I've identified something about you that is indigenous. As soon as I find one thing 
then I can attach this cactus on your face. Um, and I'm basically saying like, it's so visible, like it's so obvious that it's on your forehead and it's referencing a lot of indigenous or the indigenous part of uh, this whole dynamic. And you say that that's rooted in anti-indigeneity. Yeah. Going back to the process that we've been talking about, this one is one for me that is problematic, that there's an expectation that if I'm saying this, well, then you should also be speaking Spanish uh, back to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe, and maybe you're not. Like, el opal na frente, that's something that requires a lot of unpacking. Well, the first part that's problematic with it is that this is also promoting the narrative of that mestizaje. It's, it's something that we use kind of liberally for anyone that we want to include as part of this big homogenous uh, identity that is Latinx. Essentially, the, the images with El Opal en la Frente, it's creating again that, that contrast between someone who perhaps is an immigrant, right? Someone who, if they're an immigrant, then they must speak Spanish. And you'll notice that here we are again, <laughs> pointing at whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. this, this is another, another way that we have uh, another kind of trivial way of using language and at the same time pointing to whiteness as kind of the better option, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. if that's the case, then what is the inverse? We can choose cancel, don't cancel. We can reclaim words, right? We can infuse them with different intentions, find empowerment in, in those words. So one of the other things as well that we've talked about is how, and you're kind of like a big proponent on not policing people on how they use the Spanish language and understanding that there is no one right way. That allowing Spain to kind of decide what is authentic Spanish is problematic. One of the things that is super interesting is that a lot of times a lot of people will make fun of Puerto Ricans for not pronouncing their R's. We even did a video where we are teasing a Puerto Rican girl because she's not saying her R's. And what we didn't realize was that that is also anti-Black. Very much so, yeah. First and foremost, acknowledging uh, language variation, simply a fact of language. Everyone speaks their own idiolect, and we kind of group these idiolects with uh, different dialects or regional dialects that we can later refer as a, a unique language that follows its own set of rules. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, language in and of itself, it has no inherent value. It very much is neutral. Mm -hmm. And if we partake from that maxim, from that truth about language as a form of communication that us as human beings infuse with meaning in some way or another, then we can't move forward. So we need to kind of accept that that's the function of language mm -hmm. uh, as we understand it um, theoretically. You have this, this different variation come to the Caribbean islands by way of the, the slave trade. What you see is that among black slaves, you have this linguistic characteristic. The issue is that this characteristic then gets infused with all the racism and all these associations that, that, we, that we know exist in, in the social fabric. Essentially what you have is another, another tool of, of keeping that hierarchy, uh, keeping that contrast. Uh, in this case, it just happened to be attached with language. In, in the U.S., we think of Spain as kind of a unified object, uh, but it isn't. There's a lot of conflict even within uh, within Spain. They have a very complicated history themselves, too. Uh, and, and I think that complicated history kind of pushed, pushed certain ideologies that promoted that central power um, during the colonial period. And some of that stuff is still very much here. We should essentially stop policing each other on how we use the language. It should not be based off of like what a European country is telling us how to use it. It should be based off of the way that the people choose to communicate with one another. And maybe this discussion is not even so much about canceling and not canceling. But I think we should cancel the policing of should yes. we cancel or should we not cancel the policing of the Spanish language? Yeah, this is our, our also call to action or our call to be critical in terms of what, what is it that we're trying to kind of accept or align with and what are we rejecting? And we should acknowledge it in, from a point of empowerment where we no longer resort or look to uh, Spain or the, the entity of the colonizer mm -hmm. to police how we use language, mm -hmm. um, how we use our Spanish, um, particularly here in the U.S., like Spanglish, that's our Spanish. Yeah, that's uh, how I feel also, too. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, this is where we're at with, with our language. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you for talking and we can go on forever, but for the sake yeah. of this video, you can decide whether you want to cancel or still use these words. Now you have a little bit of knowledge. 
um, from an expert here who is telling you about it. Um, so you decide, you decide this language. I always say this language is yours. As long as you're communicating, you can do whatever you want with it. There's no space to be a policing others, but there's a lot of space to have self-awareness, see how you use language and reflective. That's how you want to align with the power of your words. Follow like.